None of that matters, and you guys don't want to hear it anyway. You've had enough of that shit, so excuse my language. Uh, when we talk about all gas, no break. A lasagna dish that my wife makes. She's Sicilian. We're going to bite a kneecap off. Uh, Step on the pedal. Good words said there. Welcome to That's Good Sports. I am Brandon. Uh, Are any of the new head coaches not going to coach a physical brand of football, Perna? Does that need to be said? What football isn't physical? Just once, I want a new head coach to be different and say, we're going to be a finesse team. We will be pushed around a little bit in hopes of drawing flags. We will get more free yards than any other team this year. Our God, Manu Ginobili. Our philosophy, safety first. Our goal, a Super Bowl with an asterisk. So today, I want to rank all of the head coach hirings. And most importantly, by the end of this episode, you will know what a Mississippi mud flap is. That's good sports. See these images? They're there to remind you to subscribe to this YouTube channel for football news and updates presented in a moderately annoying fashion. My coffee company, benchwarmerbrew.com. It's there. If you're interested in great coffee, this is a cool way to support this channel. If you're the type of person, though, that can't tell the difference between Folgers and Kraft roasted coffee, then this probably isn't for you. We source small batch organic craft coffee beans, so my coffee isn't cheap. But I guarantee you, if you taste test it next to something like, I don't know, a bag of Pete's coffee, you're gonna be impressed with my coffee. And our subscription service is the most affordable way to get my beans in your mouth. And my ridiculously corny Big Boss mug that I did not know these words would be embossed on. Pairs very nicely with my really good coffee beans. So benchwarmerbrew.com, check it out if you love coffee. Now I know what you're thinking. How can you rank all of the head coaching hirings if the Texans haven't hired their head coach? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the Texans do. They're screwed. Texans fans know it. We all know it. Which is why the Texans are at number seven. Nobody knows who this guy will be, but Vince Lombardi could rise from the dead and take this job, and I would still say this is the least impactful hiring. Until the Texans remove Jack Easterby from the picture, this franchise will be doomed to fail. Plus, the Texans may be now forced to hire Eric Bieniemy. Watson wants him, and I think his offensive coaching style is a great fit for Deshaun Watson. But I think there are, are possibly many reasons why Eric Bieniemy hasn't been given a head coaching job yet. But maybe Houston is the right place for him if it keeps Watson there. Even if Deshaun Watson stays, whoever takes this gig has to figure out how to fix a team that had a terrible record despite getting an MVP level performance out of Watson this year. That, that is incredibly hard to do. So good luck to whoever does take that job. Number six, Urban Meyer in Jacksonville. Sorry, Jags fans, I'm just not sold that Urban Meyer is the right guy to turn your franchise around. I think his complete lack of NFL coaching experience is a huge disadvantage. The last guy to do that successfully was Jimmy Johnson, and even he said coaching in the NFL is nothing like coaching at the college level, and he really emphasized the word nothing. Trevor Lawrence could make me look really stupid here. If he's truly great, then unless Urban Meyer is the second coming of Adam Gase, he will succeed. I will move Meyer to number one on this list though if he denounces Trevor Lawrence and embraces the Mississippi mud flap. Hey baby, you wanna come take a ride with the Mississippi mud flap? I am Urban and I see this video. I start making calls about trading my first overall draft pick right now. You wanna come take a ride with the Mississippi mud flat? Number five, the Eagles hire Nick Sirianni. Just because Siri is in his name doesn't mean he's going to have all of the answers. This is a weird hiring in my opinion. The Eagles fired the guy who got them to the Super Bowl only to hire the guy who was hired by the other guy who helped them get to the Super Bowl. 
Nick Sirianni was Frank Reich's offensive coordinator in Indianapolis, which to me signals that since the Eagles can't have Frank Reich, the guy who was probably second most responsible for Carson Wentz's development, they targeted the guy that Frank likes the most, Sirianni. And by the way, Nick Sirianni wears a pencil in his visor, so I'm a little surprised the Lions didn't give him more consideration. The Eagles' coaching job essentially came down to Sirianni and ironically, Josh McDaniels. And based on those two options, I'd say the Eagles hit a slam dunk out of the park. Without question, they got the better of the visor-loving coaches. Sirianni had the 12th, 15th, and 8th ranked offenses in the league based on EPA, which of course was dismantled by the Trump administration, so those numbers are meaningless to me. I do think that working with three different quarterbacks in three different seasons in Indy shows Sirianni can adapt, which will be key if Wentz is indeed the guy moving forward in Philly, and that appears to be the reason they brought in Sirianni, who at age 39 is young, that young coach who might be brilliant. But the thing that I'm not sold on is Sirianni wasn't the primary offensive play caller with the Colts. Frank Reich was. That said, he brings the likable frat guy energy with him to Philly. He also brings some soprano side character energy to an Italian heavy Philly metro area. Let's go! Woo! <laughs> Number four, this might surprise you, Detroit Lions, Dan Campbell. The Motor City did a complete 180 with this hiring, going from brains to brawn and nothing in between. Assuming the NFL starts to allow biting, Campbell may win coach of the year in 2021. All right, and so this team's gonna be built on, uh, we're gonna kick you in the teeth, all right? And, and when you punch us back, we're gonna smile at you. And when you knock us down, we're gonna get up, and on the way up, we're gonna bite a kneecap off, all right? And we're gonna stand up, and then it's gonna take two more shots to knock us down, all right? And on the way up, we're gonna take your other kneecap, and we're gonna get up, and then it's gonna take three shots to get us down. And when we do, we're gonna take another hunk out of you. Before, before long, we're the gonna be the last one standing. That is why I officially give him the nickname, Dan Cannibal. And on the way up, we're gonna bite a kneecap off. <laughs> Dan's press conference went so viral that the local news here in Denver was playing this clip. Campbell, uh, sadly has disaster written all over him. In Sharpie, on his face, like the first guy to fall asleep at a frat house. I was once duped by the fiery words of new special teams coach Brock Olivo. If you're different and you make it, how cool is that, man? Look, excitement, uh, enthusiasm, that is very contagious. Do you know what the key is to stopping Tyreek Hill? Yeah, well, yeah, so um, the flu, uh, let's just go down the list. Flat tire, didn't make it to the game. Uh, but at least losing will now be entertaining in Detroit. I have Dan in the middle though, because this might, it just might be the type of crazy that fixes the Lions. It's a much more palatable crazy than the one Matt Patricia instilled. And who knows, this could be a facade to lull his opponents into thinking he can't outcoach them mentally. And Dan Campbell actually makes me think I could be a head coach. So I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna coach this team like this city. I'm gonna run it into the ground and then slowly build it back up again. Hopefully with the aid, of some government bailout money. And even then, Still won't be desirable, but when we get on the field, we're going to punch you in the mouth. Maybe stick a little pinky up your ass. Then you might knock us down, hopefully return the favor with the pinky, but then we will shank you. We will shank you for taking too many damn honey buns from the commissary. And when the gar, I mean the refs aren't looking, We'll bite your fucking ear off. Excuse my language, but we will bite your ear off. It was Mike Tyson's best move. So we're gonna bite like Tyson. We're gonna slash like OJ. We're gonna punch like Ray Rice. That's the mentality I'm here to coach. I will literally, literally teach my guys to murder their opponents on the field. And then I'll use the great money, the great Ford Empire's money to get my guys off. Or at least have their charges reduced to manslaughter. That's the kind of coach 
I am gonna be here for the lions. <laughs> That's one of our play calls. You see if an opposing defender can figure that out. Any questions? Didn't think so. <laughs> Number three, Chargers, Brandon Staley, who I once memed as he possesses an uncanny resemblance to Jack Nicholson. Now, Brandon Staley only had one year of experience as defensive coordinator in the NFL before the Chargers decided he was head coaching material. To be fair to him, 100% of the time he's coordinated a defense, it's been number one in the league. That said, he does not get to take Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey with him to Los Angeles. Well, sort of, they are still in Los Angeles. I'm pretty sure Staley doesn't even have to move if he doesn't want to. And this hire really starts to make sense when you realize the Chargers don't have to pay for a U-Haul to move Staley and his family. I mean, they forced Philip Rivers to pay for his own mobile film room for his commute from San Diego to LA. I get that moving Rivers' entire family would have bankrupted the team, but to not even pay for this luxury ride is beyond cheap. That might be Staley's biggest problem with the Chargers. Obviously, this is another hire from the Sean McVay coaching tree, which has already produced some mixed results with Matt LaFleur, who's been incredible, and then Zach Taylor, who's been underwhelming, but has a chance to turn it around. But I put Staley here at three ahead of Sirianni because I think one of the young coaches has to succeed. Staley really stems from the Vic Fangio coaching tree, not McVeigh's, but a year with McVeigh after several with Fangio is a great blend. He might be the perfect guy to finally get that Chargers defense to live up to its potential. He has an NFL defensive background, but college experience as a quarterback, and he considers himself an offensive-minded coach due to his playing experience, so I think that's a good fit for Herbert. Number two, Arthur Smith to the Falcons. Smith faces two massive challenges in Atlanta. First, learning how to coach a team without Derrick Henry stiff-arming his way to 2,000 rushing yards. And second, fixing a perpetually broken defense that Dan Quinn and Raheem Morris, two highly regarded defensive minds, could not do. But since he didn't mention physicality in football cliche form during his presser, he gets bonus points. Here's what I like. At age 38, he's actually younger than Sirianni and a couple months older than Staley, but he looks older than both of them. I thought he was 46. In two seasons, he turned the Titans offense into a juggernaut. 62 total touchdowns last year for Tennessee, which was second only to the Packers. Atlanta, despite being fifth in passing yards, wasn't even top 10 in passing touchdowns. Derrick Henry had close to 500 more rushing yards than the Falcons had all season. I think Smith is the right guy to come in and get more out of the Falcons offense with a lot of great pieces already in place, while also improving their run game. Arthur Smith also convinced Dean Pease to let it flow and come out of retirement to be his DC. To me, that shows Smith knows how to coerce people with his words. And I like the 47 years of coaching experience Pease brings to the table. It feels similar to when Sean McVay hired Wade Phillips in his first year with the Rams. And number one, yeah, just leaves the Jets with Robert Sala, who said, Get used to the mantra, all gas, no break. When I heard that, I, I just saw about a hundred different traffic violations. He should be dead last on this list for that mantra. Get used to the mantra, all gas, no break. We're gonna kill it, okay? This is a great acronym, you guys, right? Kill it, keep it likable and learnable. Our motto, and it's gonna be on my office, is gonna be cut it loose and have fun. But I think he was the best coach available. He coached an incredibly injured 49ers defense this season, and again, got Richard Sherman's glowing endorsement, which is like an in and out loyalist saying, you know what? This smash burger, actually pretty damn good. Look, I already talked quite a bit about Robert Sala in uh, this hiring episode, but I think his energy is genuine. Like the opposite of whatever Dan Campbell's got going on. I also think the Lions didn't have a lot of choices, whereas Sala 
did. Everyone wanted Sala, had him as their top choice outside of the Jags. And he landed in a place that currently has a ton of resources to improve their team. That, more than anything else, will help Sala, as will the incredibly low expectations left by his predecessor. So even if he's average, he's gonna look like he's pretty damn good compared to Adam Gase. People genuinely like and gravitate towards Sala, and I think that extra year he got in San Francisco with Kyle Shanahan by not taking a gig last year will ultimately benefit him. Boom, power ranked, head coaches, we did it. Another video up on the screen right now. If you wanna watch that, just click it or just rewatch this video a hundred times. You know, whatever you, you got time to do today. Cut it loose and have fun.